Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, call the Johnson City Council meeting number 20 09 to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Councilmember Cope? Here. Evans? Here. Martin? Here. Ready? Yep. Soroka? Here. Okay, the next item I am going to, before I welcome everyone in the audience, I'm just going to read the COVID. COVID-19 impact statement. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with Governor Reynolds' March 19, 2020 proclamation, suspending the regulatory provisions of Iowa Code Section 21.8 or any other statute imposing a requirement to hold a public meeting or hearing, the City of Johnson will conduct meetings electronically with the public allowed to attend for instructions denoted on the meeting's particular agenda. Meeting minutes will continue to be posted per the city's normal course of business. So we've already taken roll call and I will welcome uh, any member of the public that is with us here this evening. Cindy, if they do wanna speak at any point uh, along the way, how would we know that? There is a chat function um, or a Q and A. Um, if they have questions directly for me, they can chat with me specifically or if they just have questions, they can post those questions and then we'll get them answered. Okay, okay. So we do want to welcome everyone that is with us and um, uh, Cindy has indicated how you, can, uh, how you can communicate with us and that's through the chat function uh, on the, uh, the Zoom uh, system that we have here this evening. The next item on the agenda is the agenda approval. Jim, do we have any changes to the agenda? You're muted, Jim. Pardon? Yeah, we were muted. muted. Jim, do we have any changes to the agenda? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm looking for the item. It's the uh, change order for um, the town center. And just wanted to, I think it's on the consent agenda. And just want to pull it off so we can have some explanation on that item. I'm looking for it now. I, I thought it was M. It's M, item M. There it is, okay, yes, thank you. Um, you so you would like yeah, that to be non-consent? Pardon? You'd, you'd like that to be on non-consent? Yeah, I just pull out the consent agenda so we can have some further explanation on that. Okay, I'm gonna move it now, so. Well, as soon as you make your motion, I will. Yep, that's the only change I had, Mayor. So, okay, so it's been uh, proposed that we move item M on the uh, consent agenda to the non-consent agenda. Uh, are there any other changes to the agenda? If not, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved, Councilman Martin. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Cope. Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yep. Soroka? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to public communications. We have two listed public communications this evening. The first is uh, a proclamation proclaiming police and police week and peace officers Memorial Day 2020. And I'm opening that up. And actually, uh, we also have it on the screen. This is a, a proclamation that we've issued for several years now, recognizing um, the police officers and the fine work that they do um, in our community. Um, the particular day for that recognition is May 15th, but what we do is we ask our community to observe the entire week of the 10th, let's see, where is it? Um, the 10th through the 16th as, as police week. So um, I know that uh, we have a lot of respect from our residents uh, for the police and the great work that they do here, but uh, we would just uh, encourage them to give uh, special uh, recognition to them during, during that day and during that week. 
we have another proclamation. Um, and if you could pull that one up, mine's a little bit slow here. Okay, we also have a, an, another proclamation for uh, Building Safety Month. And uh, who would know that during uh, COVID-19, how important our, uh, our uh, uh, critical, our, our folks that work in the uh, community, community development area are just in terms of uh, uh, you know, building safety and, and, and the great work that they do. Um, do want to give some special uh, recognition to the building inspection team, uh, Doug Sandvig, Craig Burhol, Eric Ram, John Taylor, and Kelsey Lizisky um, for the great work that they do, uh, making sure that um, all of the uh, inspections and the building permits and, and everything else that uh, are involved in making sure that our buildings uh, are uh, built correctly and, and up to code that, that that work is done. So again, we just want to uh, give some special recognition to that staff. So I commend that proclamation to you. And we are still under public communications. So do we have any uh, anyone from the public who is with us this evening that wants to make a comment under public communications? This would be a time when you can comment on something that is not otherwise on the agenda. I do not have any questions or chats. Okay. And we'll move on to the next item on the agenda and that is public hearings. And we have no schedule, scheduled public hearings this evening. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. We did remove item M to the non-consent agenda. And with that, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, Soroka. Martin, I second. second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion of the consent agenda? If not, then Cindy vote, please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Ready? Yep. Soroka? Yes. Evans? Yes. Oh. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the consent, uh, non-consent agenda. And let's take up item M from the consent agenda first, and that is to consider resolution number 20-104, fixing date for a public hearing on the proposal to enter into a development agreement with All Star Concrete LLC and providing for a publication of notice thereof. Jim? Um, that's not the item oh, that I had sorry. listed. Hang on, I don't know where it went when I moved it, just a minute. <laughs> okay, so then we need to back up. Nope, nope, it'll be there, just one second. I just hadn't refreshed yet. There we go. And Adam, you have control if you want it. This is Dave, I'll actually cover that. Um, let me switch. Well, was this item M on the non-consent? Yes, it was. Non yes. Yes. Okay, okay. So now it's now it's A under the non-consent. Correct. Yep, so this is a uh, change order number three um, on the Johnson Town Center project. Uh, this actually uh, came up as a result of the road project. Um, we're having to relocate the uh, Mid-American transmission lines along Merle Hay Road. Um, and as, um, as Foth and, and Public Works worked through uh, the design of that with Mid-American Energy um, and in looking at the town center site knowing we'll have needs there for um, transmission, um, it became clear that the best route was through the Johnston Town Center site instead of um, following the right of way as we would traditionally do. Um, in working through that, um, Mid-American requested that um, conduit be installed through the Johnson Town Center site so they could just set their transformers and pull the um, necessary lines to get that installed. Um, because it was all internal to the town center site where Hanson was already working, it was cheaper to have uh, Waldinger do that work. Um, that's the sub that Hanson's using for electrical work. Um, and so that was uh, the reason it was part of a change order on this particular project versus uh, funded out of the road uh, project. 
the one other sort of um, side flip to this is uh, we've known all along that we would need to run fiber to the city hall that wasn't part of the original um, agreement. Um, and we'd been waiting because we didn't know the route that that would take. We have now figured out that route. Um, and as sort of a flip, um, we're going to add the fiber installation um, as part of the road project as about an approximate uh, similar cost. I think that was just over 100000 and this one's um, just under 100000 at $92,000. So um, we're trying to um, accomplish a couple of different things here, get the Mid-American um, route and line established, and um, we'll have a, a future change on the road project that will address the fiber needs for the City Hall building. Any questions David, for David? I, I have a question. David, um, can you, do you have anything that shows the new route? What I'm, my concerns are, uh, the new route, does it take out landscaping, flexibility with the site? Um, um, I want to know the impacts of running this through the town center as opposed to around, around it. I mean, we lose flexibility in our infrastructure. Uh, no, we've we've known all along where the where their transformer pads would be. We've planned around those, um, and the route. I don't know if I'll be able to quickly find it. Um, the route mostly is under sidewalks, I believe. Okay, just a second. Let's see if I can find it and share it. Well, and it's so going further, it was going to be routed along the streets around the site. And therefore, we had known it was going to be in there. Now it's not going to be in there. Does that mean we gain more room along Merle Hay and 62nd for additional landscaping? Rhonda, this is Mrs. Matt. Uh, in order to put the, the trees out along Merle Hay, this, the route that the electric needed to take to, to put that those trees out there or that landscaping out along Merle Hay, we had to route the electric through the site. We also had some um, issues with distances. Mid-American can only pull a run so far. I, it's, it's just, um, I want to say it's somewhere between 600 and 800 feet. And the, the reason that we went through the town center was otherwise we'd have to have a transformer right at the front door, um, an front entry of the town center off of Merle Hay. And this puts the transformer pad essentially kind of at the back corner of the Keltner property, runs, follows the road to the west and then straight up through the town center, but it's underneath the sidewalk and doesn't impact any of the landscaping through the town center site. Well, it's disappointing. It's a $100,000 change when, I mean, all along we said we were going to have trees along those frontages. I mean, that was a design criteria all the way in the beginning. And now we're going to spend $100,000 to put it through the town center. Uh, I'm sort of disappointed in our designers. Unless but there was an unforeseen utility. With that, though, in order for us, to, so MidAmerican is actually paying to put this underground. We would we would normally pay the cost difference for them just to move it and stay overhead or to go underground. And I believe on this project was right around a million dollars by us going, putting the conduit in really for $100,000 saves us about $900,000 on this project. Okay. Well, that puts a different light on it. Thank you. My screen shared um, the green line on the map. It's all under pavement is the route where the conduit would go. It's either under sidewalk or parking. David, on that, could you show us where the um, transformers are then? Uh, well, there's one right next to the site support building. So just to the north west corner of the Keltner property. And there's one up along 63rd, uh, just to the east of Merle Hay. And I believe those are the only two. Is that correct, Matt? Correct. Can you zoom in on that? Because isn't there a big tree in there we've been trying to save? 
on that northwest yeah, corner. This would be right, this then on the north, it'd be right adjacent to the right of way. Okay. So that you can barely see the tree there in the, um, but it's kind of right where the orange label is. Okay. Thank you for explaining this. I appreciate it. Any, any other questions for David? If not, do we have a motion to approve change order number three with Hanson JTC LLC? Cope uh, second. And who was first? Who was who made the motion? Stop. Sorry, me. Okay. Soroika first or motion second by Cope. Uh, Cindy vote please. Councilmember Reddy? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Okay, motion passed. Moving on to item 8B, consider resolution number 20-109, a resolution renewing the agreement between the City of Grimes, Iowa, and the City of Johnston, Iowa, for the sharing of administrative resources and equipment supporting fire and emergency medical services, EMS. Just by way of explanation, this is the agreement we have with Grimes, uh, with our joint fire services. And uh, we actually started having conversations about a year ago. The, the uh, current agreement ended on um, July 1 of 2019. And so through the fire board process, we, we took um, a look at the, the agreement and updated it for a three-year term. So that's one of the changes. We want the three-year term to actually begin now going out three years. Otherwise, we've already burned up two a uh, year of the, the agreement. But... The biggest change we have in there, and I'll let uh, Chief Clark talk about that, is how we um, account for the billing for our um, fire services and, and how we work that out with the state of Iowa. And uh, uh, Chief Clark knows, has been working on that problem or issue, I guess, that, that uh, enables us to better track the, the um, rescue calls and bill them appropriately. So I'll let us, uh, item 11 now uh, there that's being highlighted at this point. So I'll let Chief Clark explain that part of it. Good evening. So the way that the state of Iowa allows you to bill for ambulance services is they actually want you to register the vehicle identification number with them. And then all the billing is tied to that specific ambulance. And so Currently, because of the joint agreement, we have ambulances that are owned by Johnston and ambulances that are owned by Grimes. And we have been trying to figure out a way to make it fair so that all of the runs or all of the calls that we get into Johnston, Johnston is able to bill for and get paid for and all the runs that happen in Grimes, Grimes is uh, do that money for the billing of the patients as well. But with the two different ambulances running out of the stations, doesn't always work out to where the patient gets picked up and transported by that city's ambulance. And so by transferring on paper, basically, the ambulances over to the administrative city, which is Johnston, then all the billing can take place through Johnston, and then the billing company will track those calls based on the zip code that the call happens in. And so then we'll be able to balance it out based on where the call happens so that each city is getting their due. So nobody's getting shorted by having the other ambulance come into the other town, pick up the patient, and then get that billing. Uh, so this way it's just easier to track it and make sure that every each city is getting everything that they're due on their billing. Any questions for Chief Clark on that? else on the agreement? Mayor, it does look like we have um, a member of the audience who may have a question. I'm going to allow him to talk. Mr. G, you can go ahead. 
Hey, uh, I actually don't have a question. This is Donald, by the way. Um, I was just interested in seeing how the city council meetings were being conducted online, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's great to see the city council and such an important part of the city. And hi, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Donald. How are you? Thanks for joining us this evening. I saw you out walking along Pioneer Parkway the other day. So. Oh, okay, nice. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Any uh, any other questions for Jim on the uh, agreement? No. Okay. Do we have a motion then to approve resolution number twenty dash one zero nine? Move approval, Cope. Second, Mount Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Councilmember Soroka. Yes. Cope. Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yep. Moving on to item 8C, consider approval of claims in the amount of $842,016.92. Do we have a motion to approve? Move approval, Cole. Second, Martin. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Cindy, vote please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Moving on to item 9A discussion on a possible town center art piece. And Jim, is this, is this your item? Adam will be handling that this evening. Adam. Good evening, Council. Um, let me see if I can. Cindy, do I have control of the uh, the agenda there? If I can pull stuff up. Yes, you do. All right, one moment then. If it doesn't work for you, Adam, just let me know, and I'll open whatever you whatever you'd like. Uh, if you could open up the JTC main sculpture RFP, yep, and then scroll down so you see the map. Uh, so for the last several months, the Arts Council has been working with uh, art consultant to Liz Lidget, who has a studio down in East Village, um, to select or recommend some art pieces within uh, the town center. On February 24th, uh, the RFP for this initial piece was released, uh, and you can see there the potential location for the art piece just east of the ice rink and the splash pad outlined in that red box. And then you can pull out of this one and then pull up um, the short version of a recommended piece uh, by uh, Ronaldo Herrera. Um, we received 16 submissions uh, for this piece and a subcommittee met uh, late last week and reviewed those um, with a general consensus that, yeah, that last page is probably the best one just to hold it on. This one? Uh, one up, one page up. The general consensus that uh, this artist here out of Ames um, had the best submission. Uh, his piece is titled Ripple or Big Fish. Uh, and it's based off of sort of Johnson's association with Sailorville Lake and Terra Lake. And I'm not sure why it's loading so slowly, but um, I don't know, it was there yeah, so now. Scroll so. through there if, if they want to see kind of the different variations okay. of it. Uh, so this was the piece uh, that was submitted and, and recommended by the subcommittee. Um, then a couple days later, the Full Arts Council met, uh, had a general consensus that this was uh, the piece to continue discussion with as well, although there was a number of outstanding questions uh, that still needed to be discussed with him, and we hadn't heard back from the artist by uh, that point, although we did hear back from him later this afternoon and add a few additional updates uh, based off of that email. Um, this recommended piece is 14 feet tall at its peak, 25 feet long and 10 foot wide. Uh, so it is a very substantial piece. It's actually a little oversized from what the RFP uh, stipulated for the parameters, which was 20 foot by 20 foot. Uh, based off the initial subcommittee discussion, uh, we did reach out to Confluence, our landscape architect on the uh, town center, and discuss whether that uh, walking path in which it sits the center of could be expanded, and they did feel that it could be as part of the ice rink uh, planning that's going on right now. 
this is also intended to be the first piece and kind of the primary piece in the art uh, of art in the town center. Uh, the hope was to have it installed by April 1st, 2021, we're going to do the RFP timeline. Uh, we are going to ask uh, this evening whether if council was supportive on this piece, generally speaking, and then try to work through some of the lighting and the material and the specific sizing and shaping of it. However, the email we received back from Ronaldo uh, this afternoon was is that he had been unable by the time of the RFP response deadline to uh, fully communicate with some of the fabricators to get a full pricing scheme on this. Uh, and so we've been working on that over the last couple of weeks. We finally got that detailed information and the cost expectations are significantly higher uh, than the $65,000 uh, cost ceiling that was stipulated in that RFP. Um, to maintain its current size and material, it would be a, nearly double that. So in light of that, I think we have some additional discussion um, at the Arts Council to revisit whether this is the appropriate piece or whether it could be modified uh, beyond some of the other uh, design changes that were being explored. Uh, so for this evening's purpose, I guess we're just looking for some general feedback, whether the full council is um, likes this piece or if you perused through some of the other submissions, whether there's other pieces that stood out to you. Um, but I don't think we need a full recommendation at this point. We really just need a little bit of direction and then some further discussion with the Arts Council to see uh, where we should head from there of whether we need to allocate some additional funds to the central piece, uh, look further into uh, fundraising options, or explore other artist piece or other pieces by this artist. And I'll just kind of leave that out there if Eric or Rhonda or Scott, who all uh, attended those meetings as well, have any additional comments on the uh, central piece here. Mayor, if it's okay, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Sure. This is, this is Jim, and I just wanted to point out to the council as well, that there was a public process that this followed um, in trying to identify and select the artists. And, and as Abbott mentioned, there were 16 submittals from different artists. This was sent out to artists, uh, central Iowa artists, as well as artists across the country. And, and uh, the, from the submittals, this is the one that the committee um, uh, felt was um, the, the one that they liked best. But I did at least want to let the council know that there was a public process. There was uh, an, an attempt, an effort to um, notify many artists across the, the central Iowa and in the country of the, the opportunity to submit on this. And, and so the, the committee has uh, selected this as their preferred alternative at this point. And by public process, what you're, what you're saying is that an RFP was sent out to artists in state as well as out of state to, you know, to, to respond to the RFP, correct? Yes, yes, that, yeah, that's what I meant. The R, an RFP was put together and, and sent out. So this could have been submitted by, or, you know, a, a proposal submitted by, um, you know, a, a quite a number of people that uh, do have interest and do this type of work. There is also RFPs prepared and will be sent out for all the other art pieces that are proposed in the town center. You know, I'd like, I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Councilman uh, Woman Martin and was it uh, Councilman Sorica? Yeah. Um, I, will, I, I will talk first, I guess. Um, there was quite a range of artwork that was presented to the council. Although a lot of the artwork was smaller in scale than what we really wanted. Um, the direction we tried to give in the RFP was that we were looking for a sculpture piece that would incorporate um, uh, light for sure. And maybe some uh, lighting effects or motion or perhaps wind, not a static traditional piece of artwork, but something that was viewed in different times of the day or from different points of view and would ha be lively and interesting. But we, we left it pretty, pretty open, but that very specifically, they needed to work in light so that at nighttime, it could be a really fabulous element. Um, this, uh, this artist is from, works up at Iowa State University. He has a background in quite a few other sculptures that are very nice. Um, we liked the fact that he was from Iowa. That was a big uh, 
uh, plus. He worked a lot, he asked a lot of questions. And so he got really informed and he, he really did a lot of in-depth study about Johnston in the region. And um, the, the pre presentation that they, he's given us has this, we're not 100% sure because it's, like, it's not like it's a model, it, we're looking at a picture, but it has these scales that we assumed would shimmer and change with the light of day. So all of those things, plus the size of it, made it very appropriate, we thought, and, the, and by far it was our favorite one for this location. And now I'll let Councilman Soroka it, w tell you what he thinks of it. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much hit it on the head. Um, some takeaways I heard from the discussions um, at the Arts Council level is there was a pretty overwhelming consensus that out of the submissions received, this is the one that people um, were most interested in. Some of the reasons why it sounded like that, um, there were comparisons of it made to um, the Nomad piece um, at downtown Des Moines, where it's a guy sitting made out of letters that people can walk into as a sculpture garden and um, take pictures. This one, this image you're seeing right here is one version of this uh, piece. Um, the sculptor had also included an image where you can actually walk into the sculpture, kind of the belly underneath there, um, which the council was interested in because um, that would be, you know, a draw, people would be able to interact with it, and it'd also be um, just something that you're able to get up close with. Um, as far as the size goes, I think that was, that's something important to note is um, a lot of us really liked how large it was because it is the main piece and felt like in the, you know, large expanse of the yard, we wanted something that would stand out. And then also as Councilwoman Martin touched on the story kind of narrative that the artist crafted it was very clear and evident that he had done the most research and really been thoughtful about tying together why this piece would make sense for Johnston. Um, the one thing is based off the um, uh, email tonight, this evening or whatever, that this piece is, would come in way more than was budgeted. I think um, as Adam had mentioned in the email, it probably raises questions of if it's something that we actually feel strongly about that we want to pursue at the size and scope that it is, we might need to consider doing a revised RFP so that other people have um, an opportunity to offer their own proposals at this scale. Because um, like I said, since the size and scale of it was something we liked so much, a lot of other artists that submitted things just didn't get to that scale because I assume they're trying to meet, meet the budget. Just one uh, additional piece of information. It's not abundantly clear, I guess, unless you've kind of read through the RFP, but the uh, the Ripples piece is made out of CNC uh, metal fabrication. Uh, so there is uh, some light that would be bouncing off of that. Uh, he did provide us several alternatives to try to bring that budget price down. Uh, one included some different materials that would be painted white. Uh, another included a significant reduction in size, and I think some of those will be topics of conversation as we come back at, at the Arts Council meeting. So, Councilman Soroika raised an interesting question for me. Um, was this response, is, is this piece responsive to the RFP? So, I think it was, but the problem is the artist couldn't get the material pricing due to COVID, yeah, right there where it says it, couldn't get the material pricing before the RFP deadline. So they submitted this with kind of, I mean, I don't know if this is their best guess because they said now it's coming in twice over. So that's like not ideal. Um, but that's just, it kind of leads to the question of if we're liking this kind of quality and size, you know, I'm not sure that we should disqualify all the other artists who were sticking to the original budget. If we want to get a really quality statement, you know, piece to scale, 
then I think it makes sense to ask people to, you know, match what his budget is. Because essentially now it's like his idea, we all liked it, but it was assuming that it was the same price that everyone else had to work with. But actually his idea ended up being, you know, one that's twice what we had given everyone else to work but with. The proportion so. of it, did it, I mean, was, did he exceed the proportion that was laid out in the RFP? He did. Um, and then my understanding, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, we had gone back to check if that would be doable, you know, with the size of everything there. And it sounded like it would be roughly, um, especially because that kind of piece tilts up um, on the edges. So um, as far as what he submitted, it was larger than what was specified in there, but seemed doable at least. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my, what I was, what I was going to share before that issue was raised is I, I'm really excited about this artist um, for some of the reasons that uh, Councilwoman Martin and, and Councilman Soroika have already pointed out. This guy did a lot of research. I mean, it's, it's just interesting to go through and read, you know, re, kind of read the stories, the narratives behind the uh, art pieces that he came up with. Um, I have to, I have to admit, when I first saw the fish sculpture, it was like, okay, what does that have to do with Johnston? <laughs> um, you know, after I read the narrative, you know, I kind of warmed up to it more. I mean, it's, it's a very attractive piece. It was just like, but I can't figure out why we're putting a fish in the middle of the, of the town center, other than the fact that, you know, we do have Sailor Bell, but he, he did a lot of research and, and, and I could, I could get, I could potentially get there with him. Um, I also liked, uh, you know, I, I looked at very closely at his other pieces that he offered. And again, he did a lot of research. Um, you know, I, I was interest, I was kind of interested in the, the piece that is intended to represent agriculture, except that when I look at that piece, it doesn't look like corn to me. It looks like a peanut. <laughs> Um, which is not, does not represent, you know, Iowa agriculture. Um, but I also found the other piece uh, very attractive. Um, and and I, could, I, could, I could actually visualize that other piece being at the town center as well. So I'm really excited about this artist. I'm excited about the, you know, the designs that he's come up with as well as, as uh, you know, the work that, the effort that he put into trying to figure out what would work um, in Johnston. Um, but I'm a little disturbed by the, 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 the issue now that's been, that's been raised about the RFP. Is it, um, this is Councilman Cope. I, I, a couple of thoughts I had. One, um, I, I think you, we could address the issue with the RFP by one, reissuing another RFP uh, with either a larger budget figure or, or try to figure out how to address that. I think if you, that, that's sort of the fair way to do it. His, his, his project sort of fit the criteria, a new criteria, the new RFP, and then open it up for other folks. So I think you could address it that way. Second of all, and um, on, the, on this, this, the, the fish sculpture, I am very intrigued by the option of it being of the sort of the belly being open and you can walk into it. When I first looked at it, the sculpture, I was like, yeah, okay, it's fine. But then when I scrolled down and I saw the version where you could walk into it, I was, I completely got much more excited about it because to me, it much made it much more interactive. Um, it made it, you know, something that, that you could really feel a, an ownership or participation in. So I, I would really like to pursue, um, I mean, obviously, if we do another RP, you know, figure out that process. But I, I really like that the fish sculpture with the open belly that is is interactive. I think that's great. I also like the harvest sculpture, the the corn. I mean, I, it took me a while to figure out what why it didn't look like a kernel of corn and why it looked like really the intern. And it, I mean, I understood his scientific reason for it. I, the outside might might want to reshape the outside, but I got why he did the inside that looks like a peanut. But Anyway, I, I, I think that that's a really cool, and to me, it was very scientific focused. And I thought that, to me, that'd be a great uh, attraction, you know, somewhere on, on the, um, uh, you know, on the town center concept or, or even at Terra Park or, you know, anywhere in the community. So 
um, yeah, I, I'm excited about what this guy does, and, and, I, and I think if we want to, you know, reissue the RFP uh, to sort of uh, think about a bigger budget, I mean, we've, we've done some things already across this project, whether it be moving away from the hard ice or other things, I, I would say that we probably have generated enough savings that we could look at putting a little bit more money into this sculpture, and, and, I, and I think it's, you know, the art is kind of, if you do it right, it really is, you know, really make, is, makes it. If you don't do it right, it has zero impact at all. And so to me, I think it, it, let's do it right. And um, I, I, so anyway, those are just my thoughts. Cindy, could you go to the, um, um, the, long, the longer submittal that he's provided? I think it gives everybody a better idea of what, who this guy is and what he does. Uh, while Cindy's pulling that up, maybe I'll just interject real quickly as well that the uh, the overall art budget for the town center is $150,000. This piece is able to be put in uh, more or less immediately, as would be the mural uh, that would go on the concession stands building. Um, the other pieces we're intending to hold off until there are uh, commercial buildings constructed adjacent to them so that they don't need to be removed or won't get damaged during the construction of those commercial buildings given the new kind of COVID timeline of construction for that uh, first two buildings at the intersection of 62nd and Burr A, uh, those two art pieces will probably not be able to be installed for some time. Uh, and that means probably not paid for through that lease purchase contract um, where we've allocated $150,000 as well. So, uh, you know, again, it's, it's all dollars being spent one way or another uh, but of that $150,000 allocation. Uh, it's more likely now that we can only purchase two pieces through that uh, as opposed to three or four as we were initially. Well, right, but that presumes you keep the budget line at about $150,000. I, I mean, you could you could also consider taking some of the savings we've generated for some other decisions we've made and you could add additional funds to that, correct? Correct, yeah, there's also the owner's contingency bucket, which uh, right. has several hundred thousand dollars and then the additional savings created by the uh, the changes to the ice rink. Also to one thing, um, Mayor, your point about the fish tie-in is well taken and multiple people brought that up at the Arts Council level as well. Um, that's one thing that uh, again, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think is still outstanding to Reynaldo is kind of the idea of, you know, does it necessarily have to be a fish or is there opportunity to, you know, someone had suggested um, making kind of a cornucopia type thing, reflecting harvest and, mm. you know, tying into pioneer and ag, kind of that type of way. So all that's just to say, um, your concerns are shared. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's something still being explored by the okay. community trying to figure that out. Well, that's, that's, that's good to know. Um, because it, it wasn't obvious to me and, and I, I don't know that everybody will read through a you know three page narrative to figure out, okay, now I understand. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to suggest, I do think making it open, that open concept like he's got with the fish, you could do that with the cornucopia, I would presume as well. Uh, I, I just think that really, to me, it, it, it makes it a much more sort of like, and I think, I think Councilman Soroka, you mentioned it sort of like the sculpture at the downtown sculpture garden where people can go inside it and sort of get a different perspective. I think that those types of, of pieces where that people can really sort of interact with it in some way uh, tend to have more um, uh, uh, people get more excited about those. And so I, I think we should kind of keep that. At, that, that uh, my excitement about putting more money into the budget goes up by the more that I think the pieces are are sort of uh, interactive in that way. And so I, I'd like us, whether it's a fish or a cornucopia, to keep that concept of it being something that people can interact with more. Completely agree. Uh, if we're done talking about that piece, as I mentioned, we'll get the Arts Council back together and kind of further explore options. It sounds like there's interest in reissuing an RFP, perhaps uh, in short order to give other artists that participated in the initial one and maybe others uh, the opportunity to participate under a higher budget. But uh, I think we'll, we'll get that Arts Council back together if everybody's all right with that and uh, come up with a, a more firm game plan. 
also and wanted to touch Adam, on Adam, Adam, would it, would it be appropriate, and I, I'm, I'm, this is a, a, a genuine question, would it be appropriate to provide some feedback to Ronaldo on uh, our discussion and thoughts here? Uh, yes, that, some of that dialogue's already occurring. I think the hope is to probably get him in front of the Arts Council uh, at some point in the future to talk about the lighting and kind of the different design options that are out there. Um, we just, it's been a very short order kind of turnaround on this. They had a council meeting coming up, so we wanted to give you guys a quick update um, prior to having those additional conversations to make sure that we're on the right path. Great. Uh, so real quickly then, the other art piece RFP that was issued was the uh, pedestrian entrance. And Cindy, I think before you try to give me control, uh, I'm logged in twice, one under my phone and one under my computer. If you maybe try the other one, uh, it would work for me. But uh, otherwise, you can click on the uh, Johnson Town Center entrance sculpture proposals. Yeah. Okay, great. You got it now, Adam? I got her now. Thank you. Uh, so we also reviewed the initial submissions uh, for the two pieces that would go adjoining to that intersection here. So on each side of that uh, angled walk into the town center. Um, there wasn't one that particularly stood out to the committee as a, an instant yes, kind of like the way that the, uh, the Ripples one did. But we did have a couple of artists um, that we were intrigued by. Uh, the first here is Lee Looning. Uh, who does kind of these musical interactive pieces. Uh, and so I think we wanted to have some additional conversation with her to see if she had some other ideas and some other submissions. Uh, so that was one thought that came out of uh, that submission. And the second was again, coming back to uh, Ronaldo Carrera, uh, who had the idea here of sort of these kites um, being on each side of the entrance as well. Um, now I'm not sure if we were particularly sold on any of the specific designs, but we're intrigued by the overall idea. Uh, so, again, Liz has kind of reached back out to him on this one as well to have some additional conversation. There was the thought of, well, do we want to, one artist to have both of these pieces? And so that's kind of part of that dialogue as well. So uh, there's no specific action here really being taken place on this one other than some further discussion. Uh, but just wanted to make sure Council had the opportunity to, to kind of bruise through some of those submissions here that we saw as well. And I'll also just touch on this one real quickly. Uh, there was an idea at one point uh, along the main road intersection entrance into the town center, so further north than the 62nd World Bay intersection, of doing an art piece that might be reflective of uh, saying the yard or the town center. Nice. Uh, so this is just kind of a good example, I guess, of incorporating art uh, with maybe some branding. Uh, Dave will shut his ears for a minute and, and ignore the signage component of that. Um, so no, again, no specific action on that one as well, but just kind of wanted to show you this once you had an idea of one potential concept that's out there in the future. I just want to say one thing about this. Um, Ronaldo again had one of the pieces that I liked quite a bit. It's the one that's after the kites that he's proposing. And one thing to think about is it'd be nice to, if, and this is not a sculpture we're going to do right away, as we, as uh, Adam just said. But one of the things we had started talking about on the art council was we have an opportunity for several pieces of artwork, and that we should spread the spread the work around to different sculptors, which is still a very valid way of valid approach. Um, another thing we could also look at is if there is some cohesive elements of Ronaldo's sculpture, Ripples, the big fish, that he brings into the kites or he brings into these other elements, it may tend to pull the whole town center together in a good way. Because we're really not doing a sculpture park. You know, we're not, so, I, so I'm just telling you, I don't, have a, I don't have one way or the other to go. I think it's a good idea to have different sculptors, yes, but also, if you use one sculptor for a few of, you know, several of these elements and they all relate to each other, they will bring the town center into focus more. So something to think about at that time. I, I, this is Councilman Cup. I, I strongly agree with what Councilman, Councilwoman Martin said about the continuity piece. I think that's a really good point. 
at the same time, I think the piece of art she was talking about was the ripples with the kind of a bunch of different colors. And, and yeah, and that, and, and of the work that he did, that was my least favorite. But again, you know, that's his claim. Art is, it's exactly, exactly. It's, it's in the eye of the beholder. And so, um, uh, I, I, um, um, so, but I, I, I do agree with, I think you make a really good point about the fact that to continuity, that concept of continuity, I think makes a lot of sense. Adam, anything else on that? Adam? Got me with the mute. That was all I had for the uh, Art Council update. Okay. So let's move on to item 9B, an update on the, oopsie, the town center concession. Sorry, Paul, I'll cut you off there. That's all right. <laughs> My iPad had gone down as well, so there we go. All right, so over the last month here, we've had a number of conversations about some adjustments to the splash pad, uh, to the ice rink, and those conversations are still kind of uh, ongoing. Uh, but we have tried to finalize some design changes to the concession stand building, uh, which formerly housed the cooling equipment, uh, presuming that we move forward with the artificial ice. And so that's why you see kind of this open area area here. This is actually, it was intended to be non-roofed and that's where that cooling equipment and the ventilation occurred. Uh, so there's been uh, a meeting about once a week here about talking through some revisions to this building and how we can make it useful, um, aesthetic uh, and kind of functional uh, within the context of the ice rink and the rest of the town center. Uh, and this is kind of the, where we've landed on a design concept here. Um, looks very similar, except you've got uh, a number of different uses now. I'll show you the floor plan real quickly. It's probably the easiest way to understand what's all going on in there. Uh, so on the far west side is really kind of the dedicated concessions area. Um, we're trying to do two things here. Uh, first, uh, be able to kind of vend some uh, pre-pepped food, food. Uh, so you're not making any food in here, just kind of hot chocolate, coffee, candy bars, popcorn, maybe hot dogs. Uh, when you've got a concert in the summer, this is where you'd be uh, selling sodas or beer. Um, and then you also need to be able to vend out the skates from this instead of bringing in the trailer, which was originally intended uh, to sit just north of this building. So we want to create some separation between um, the vending of that skates and the skate sharpener, which would potentially be on the far south side here and the actual food preparations. You also wanna maintain a sight line over to the artificial ice rink so that if you only have one or two staff members working, they can still kind of keep an eye on that as well as with the security cameras uh, and some of the other technologies, such as the sound system that would be housed within this area. Uh, so we've talked through a number of different floor plans. Um, this is kind of an adapted one that OPN has come up with based off of the committee discussion. Uh, so it's probably the first time I think everybody's seen it and it still may change a little bit, but it tries to meet that need of having uh, some separation, but also some sight lines without minimizing the walls. And then it kind of accounts for all of the different uh, equipment elements that we've kind of talked about having in this space, such as refrigerators, and deep freezers, and popcorn makers, storing a sufficient amount of ice skates, having that skate sharpener. So you have one window to the north, um, which would have a label or a sign above that, such as concessions or ice skating equipment. And you also have another vending station, and this would be a clear glass. Uh, so on a cold day, you can have it closed, but still have that sight line. And then potentially uh, windows here off to the east, which would open up into this uh, non-enclosed area, which would have some heaters up here, but maybe where you have the lines and people are kind of gathering their stuff up or waiting for their uh, rest of the family to use the restrooms. Um, and so you can vend out those skates over here. Uh, so the open area then would have some shade sails that you could uh, pull out uh, in the winter time. Uh, would have some bars uh, that actually go across here that would have heaters and speakers on there, uh, give a little bit of warmth on a cold day, weekend. Have a type of a decorative fencing along the south side to kind of protect um, against the adjoining properties or people kind of causing some mischief in this little alleyway back here. Uh, and then you have uh, 
a male and a female restroom uh, with four stalls or two urinals and two toilets apiece on the men's side with an adult changing station uh, in the sinks there. So this area is really intended to be functional. It's not an area that you're gonna be hanging out uh, long-term in part because you have those adjoining restrooms, um, but it does have the opportunity to kind of expand that canvas of the artwork, which was originally intended just along that north wall and to wrap it around onto the uh, west facing wall of the uh, eastern part of this building. And then the final portion of it here is on the far east. You'd have an overhead garage door. This is where you could potentially store uh, those pallets of uh, the uh, ice slabs and some additional larger equipment that might be out here as well. Uh, see if I'm really missing anything else here. Uh, so that's that's kind of the information I have for you on where we're, we've headed on the concessions building. As I said, we've got some concepts now kind of that we've talked through on the splash pad that would expand it to the north and the south and add some above ground features on kind of the northern end and the southern end. Uh, we'll probably be bringing those back to you here at the next council meeting or two. Uh, we just don't have quite the time constraints that we do on uh, this building. So we've really been focused on trying to to get through the design changes on this so that Hanson can get going on that in a timely fashion. Um, and we also are still then working through the, uh, the total cost numbers of what the changes would be for the expansion of the splash pad, uh, the change to the artificial ice and the, the interior finishings, uh, which would raise prices uh, for this concession stands building. So um, that's typically what I got, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So Adam, does this go back to the subcommittee one more time or where, where are we at in the process? Yeah, Man we do have another committee meeting scheduled uh, for next week. Uh, so I'm sure that OPN will be talking through this. And uh, honestly, I've just kind of got my eyes on it here in the last couple of days. So I think there'll probably be some additional staff feedback as well. But uh, from what I've been hearing in the committee conversation so far, I think it's probably on the right track, uh, barring some, some minor revisions. Yeah, it's, it's, it appears to be very reflective of our last conversation. So, looks good. Uh, so, Adam, just one question I've got is the, the materials, exterior materials, tied into the same material, similar materials that are used for City Hall? Yes, it is. Um, so, this is that same uh, material that's being used on the front of the City Hall there. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it's kind of. Kind Swiss of like pearl. Swiss pearl. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I I, I don't need it, but it's, it's, as long as it's tied in similar, that's cool. So. Um, I think there are also just as one additional element since we've talked about kind of lighting and using those multicolored lights in several other areas. Uh, I think there's an option that we'll probably talk about one more time at the committee of, of being able to do some of that lighting scheme here and as well, uh, so kind of tie it in with the rest of the town center lighting that we have on front of city hall, and potentially on the splash pad as well. No question for me, but just a comment. Um, just want to say thanks to staff and also pass along thanks to the architects for remembering and figuring out a way to put in the adult size changing tables. Really excited to see that. I'll pass that along. Uh, I'll also give you just one other staff update. Um, Monday at 10 a.m., the uh, Small Business Relief Program will be rolling out uh, with official announcements. Uh, I probably saw an email from me a little earlier here today on that. Um, the private fundraising has gone very well, so they've actually increased the uh, per capita allocation for communities that have made that full community match from a dollar to at least a dollar fifty. Uh, that may go up further. Uh, but in that email, I did include the link of where those applications will be able to be received and, and filled out. So uh, if you have anybody that you think might want to be uh, applying for that, uh, you can send them that link. Again, it's not first come, first serve, so they have uh, some time to get all that information gathered. They don't need to feel that time crunch. Uh, but the application window will close on the 20th. Any questions for Adam on that? Did you say that was tomorrow that's coming by or is it Monday it's coming by? Tomorrow at 10 a.m. It should be. Tomorrow. Uh, okay. okay. That's good. Okay. Let's uh, go to uh, 
city administrator comments. Jim, do you have anything further this evening? Yes, we have a couple of uh, items that we want to talk about uh, real quickly with the council. Uh, one being the phasing opening of um, city facilities and city services. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about when we open and how we open and those kinds of things. And so I just want the council to know that our department heads have been thinking about how we phase the opening of our different facilities and how we phase our staff back into more of a, a normal work situation. We put no timeline to these conversations because we don't really have a timeline at this point in time, but we think it's important to start beginning to think about uh, what the phasing is and and when the timeline starts to happen when we'll be reopening facilities we will uh, begin on the, the process so um, as we've looked at all of our facilities and programs there are phases that we're uh, talking about and primarily the phases are to make sure that we open safely that it's safe for our employees and safe for our citizens as we open our facilities and and begin to get back um, more towards normal. So I did ask a couple of department heads this evening if they just share some of the highlights of their plans so that the council can at least get an idea as we as we further talk about this and um, get our plans more definitive. We will share that information with the council as we go um, move on and and preparing to reopen our government. So with that, I'd like to have Eric make some comments on some of the phases they've been talking about with the library. Uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, in addition to the phases that I'll outline here, uh, we've been working on procuring supplies in preparation for reopening, including cloth face masks for staff gloves, uh, disinfecting wipes and spray. Um, we have several thousand items out right now as our book returns are all closed and we're not accepting returns. So the first part of the phase is several days of allowing returns to come back into the building. They'd be placed in quarantine for three days. Then we'd start checking those items in and preparing them to be picked up, several of them will be on hold for people. Uh, another part of us being closed for this amount of time is that we have hold requests that have been backed up for weeks. Phase two of our plan is to allow patrons to pick up up to 20 items curbside outside the library. The library itself would be closed to patrons. Phase three, we would continue curbside hold pickup uh, while allowing up to four patrons at a time to come in the building by appointment to use computers and print. Again, each of these phases has quite a bit of detail that I'm not going into, but I can if there are questions. Phase four, we would allow patrons with holds to come into the library to pick those up. So we would stop curbside hold pickup uh, and allow people to come into the lobby to pick up their holds and use the self-check. We continue limited computer use by appointment. Uh, we'd also start allowing limited browsing of our stacks. Uh, you know, depending on what the recommendations are, we would likely limit the number of people in the building. And finally, uh, phase five would be back to normal where we'd start up library programs um, as you all know, we're a spot where a lot of people, that a lot of people rely on to have community meetings like homeowners association, those sorts of things. Um, so this uh, phase five would be starting up programs and also starting up community meetings again, essentially getting back to normal. happy to answer any questions or go into more detail. Uh, kind of like Jim said, how long each of these phases last is kind of up in the air. What triggers each phase to start is also kind of up in the air. Um, the governor doesn't seem to be reopening in the same way that we closed everything down. So it's hard to predict, you know, what the recommendations are going to be, if they're going to be based on building occupancy or you know, group size or what? Eric, I think in, in uh, the 77 counties that she has 
reopened to some extent. Libraries were one of those public buildings that she said uh, should be reopened, but with some limited capacity um, and social distancing. Uh, is That's correct, isn't it? Um, I, I'm not sure about that. Okay, well, yeah. I think I think it is, and and what I was going to say is that you know the good news is we've got others that are going before us, <laughs> so there there will right. be opportunity to learn you know from what others have done in terms of opening up their libraries and and just generally their public buildings. One important point I should mention um, is that metro area libraries are talking to each other about all this and we'll do what we can to coordinate reopening of services so that there's not one library that's kind of bombarded by all this pent up demand for libraries in the metro. That's great. Thank you, Eric, and I appreciate that last point because I do want the council to know that all of us within our professional organizations and associations are communicating with each other. Uh, no matter what department or what we provide for service. And so there is a, a behind the scenes, a real coordinated effort, not only with what we're going to do in Johnston, but, uh, you know, how we're going to work with our colleagues across the metro. So, and I think Eric gives a good example of, of what a thoughtful phased approach would be, because that's probably, not probably, that is how this is going to happen. And it'll be different for every department, um, the phasing for, the parks is going to be different than the library that's going to be different than city hall. And so, um, uh, but with that, I, I also asked um, uh, um, John to talk a little bit about the phasing for um, how they plan to reopen some of the park facilities. All right. Thanks, Jim. Can everybody hear me? Sure. <laughs> um, all right, so we are, as Jim mentioned, we've been talking a lot as uh, park professionals throughout the metro of different ways that we could envision opening, especially starting with facilities. And the basic concept uh, that we have is we feel like our facilities are very similar to restaurants in that as the governor starts opening those types of facilities here in Polk County, that we should be following the same type of guidelines. So, um, for instance, when we move forward towards opening, um, we should be following the guideline of if, if it's 50% occupancy, 25% occupancy, whatever that is, we'll be working with all the groups that, uh, that we have during that time period and work with them to make sure that they understand what the capacity of the building is. Um, We've always been strong because this is a senior center. We've always been fairly strong with making sure that we have hand sanitizers, cleaning supplies, those things out and available. Um, but the one major thing that we will start doing is between every single group, we will sanitize the building. So when we have weekend groups, we will have to um, have the ability to, to sanitize the building between groups. Um, the positive, well, I don't know if it's a positive, but uh, we have had a lot of groups that have already started moving weddings and things like that because there's so many unknowns of when the facilities will open. A lot of them are already transferring to 2021, 2022. So we don't have a huge number of groups over the next two to three months that are still actively uh, booked in for our facilities. So we want to take those same approaches that the restaurants do because it, in a lot of ways it's really the same type of service that is being provided here. Um, we'll spread out tables, making sure that we can keep the social distancing. We'll limit the number of chairs per table. Um, we'll do all those, all those steps that will be necessary. Um, we've been, I've been trying to communicate uh, with the senior director. Um, she has mentioned at this point, there is not a plan for the, the, congregate meal site, when that will be coming back or how that will be coming back. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking at that as well. Um, I believe as we start opening exterior or interior facilities, we can start looking at the same time as uh, open up more of the exterior facilities, that being our shelters, our playgrounds, those types of things. Um, we don't have a definitive plan at this point through the Metro of how 
to do that and at what point to do that. Um, but once again, very similar to the library, we want to do it together as a group to make sure that one town doesn't open and have a flock of people coming over to use those types of facilities. Um, shifting gears with programs. Um, programs will be, I think, a little bit easier for us versus a lot of communities. Um, we don't have pools. We don't have those types of uh, highly uh, participant summer programs. Um, the programs that we do have that we were planning for this summer um, relate to yoga out in the yard, um, different runs, different DNR run programs. So we have a lot of programs that I believe that we could start opening up this summer because we can keep social distancing to a maximum with with those types of programs. So um, once again, we're going to we're going to try to work with the other communities to make sure that we're doing these types of activities at a similar time. Um, but it is one of those things that I feel like we could start start up uh, this summer and uh, allow a little bit more of a, a hands on activity versus the uh, static activity that's currently happening. Um, I guess the best no news is that uh, our parks are being used, especially Tara. I'm sitting here at my desk every single day and it's just amazing how many people are out in the park and 99% of the people are using social distancing and doing exactly what they need to be doing. So it's a great thing. With that, if you're, you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate that. And, and as I said, we're, we will continue to share information as it becomes more available and the time frame start getting more realistic. Uh, and then I also asked Matt Greiner, who um, uh, is to discuss what their plans are as far as public work staff and, and uh, getting our employees back to more what we'd consider full strength. So Matt, if you could share your ideas at this point. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, public Works is currently operating at a 50% staffing level. We are preparing to move to a three-quarter staff level. Um, the three-quarter staff level would allow us to keep a, a couple of folks um, back home um, and paid on call as long as they are, um, that would help us in case there was an exposure that we would still be able to, to maintain our essential functions within the department. Um, that would approximately last about three weeks. And then after that, we would uh, plan to return to full staff levels. Um, a lot of that is very fluid with, with what's happening and when um, we reopen with what the, when the governor kind of lifts some of these restrictions. And then we're currently also working on a plan to how, how to get um, some of our, our water staff into to residents' homes. We're working through that with some of the Metro Public Works directors and having those conversations. And that would be to repair water meters or, or to do other um, functions that those folks go into to residents' homes to, to do. So there'll be more to come on that once once we kind of work through that process and have a plan for that. But um, we're, we're looking at moving to that three-quarter staff level and then back to, to full strength here in the near future. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, so I, I wanted to give the council just a flavor for what our staff is thinking about and how we're looking at the phasing of, for the reopening. Didn't want to leave anybody out that would want to share anything at this point, but I just at least wanted to get some samples from some of our departments on, on their plans. Does anybody else want to share anything from their department at this point? Jim, I have that spreadsheet to talk about whenever you want me to. Okay, well, that, you can probably go ahead and talk about it now, Teresa. Um, Cindy, could you put that up for me? Um, and maybe, yeah, thanks. Um, one of the, uh, the League of Cities put out a finance tool uh, for cities to use. And um, if you could scroll up just a little bit, Cindy, what they, um, just so I could see that there. Um, they basically um, asked, gave us some suggestions on how we could do some calculating. And um, in that first column or column B, the figures that are in column B are revenues that were anticipated in this budget year. <clears throat> they suggested we either use last year's actual dollars or what I had budgeted for this year, I used what was budgeted. 
their um, formula, then took it and, and divided them up quarterly, no matter what. And then I was um, to put the assumptions in there on what I thought we would maybe um, not get. So um, obviously those assumptions could be could be wrong or not wrong, but um, they did quarterly thinking that COVID has affected the last quarter of our budget year, all right? And so either we could have said, you know, how much of that last quarter do we think maybe we won't get? And so my guess was maybe 5% on property taxes, maybe we won't collect up to 5%. Um, local option sales tax, even though I don't, I don't have that budgeted, but um, because we didn't know our estimate was going to be when this all started clear back 18, I guess, 24 months ago now, because we're almost done with it. But Jim did ask that I plug in there what we are getting. So I did do that. And um, the suggestion by other Metro Finance people are that we're losing probably at least 30% of our um, local option sales tax, hotel motel tax, about 25% of road use tax this last quarter. And then um, our interest income uh, has dropped significantly. Uh, we were doing so well, um, but now that has went down. And then um, program fees, um, licenses, permits, program fees included things like John was just talking about renting Crown Point, renting um, Simpson Barn, those types of things. Also any other miscellaneous fees or revenues that we have. And then for water, sewer, stormwater, I'm just estimating about maybe a 10%. And that really is, that's a real a big wide factor, quite honestly. But we're not charging any late fees. We haven't in April, May, we, I don't know what we'll do in June. Um, so, and we're not shutting people off. So those are, again, just the gaps. Anyway, um, came up with about a um, little over a million dollars of maybe anticipated revenue that we won't get. Um, how confident am I in those numbers, you might ask? Um, I still think I've been very conservative like I always am. Um, so um, I, I think it will, I, I hope it won't be that much. Um, I certainly hope it's not over that. So I, I guess I think I've been very, uh, very conservative, but I've had several different models that I've used, been on a bunch of different webinars. They've changed some GASB rules and some GASB implementation dates for us, which is going to be helpful uh, um, in the finance record keeping world for us. So I'm just, I guess, want you to know that I'm watching it constantly. I wish I could give you a really clear picture into a crystal ball. Um, I have been asked whether we thought we needed to make any budget cuts. My answer to that is a definite no. Um, all the department directors have known that this would be just like any other time in your life and you need to tighten your belt. Well, we know that people aren't going to trainings right now. They aren't traveling. We know our, our fuel bill is really lower than it has been in a long time. And um, so we're saving money in weird sorts of ways. Um, I don't think there's any reason that I would ever feel like I have to tell you that we need to cut money. Everyone knows to hold off on big purchases right away after July. And um, I should get another pretty good property tax check here in about two weeks. It should have the rest of our backfill in it. And um, and we'll go from there. The local option sales tax, they haven't cut back on the estimate. They continue to give us what our estimate is. And everyone tells me that. If we have to make that up, they'll just take a they'll take away a little bit more of what the estimate was in the future to come. So it's not like we have to pay them back a big check. So that's my update. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you, Teresa. And as as she said, we will keep the council updated as we 
uh, that information becomes more clear. And if there aren't any questions on the COVID issues, I, I, there's one other um, citizen issue I'd like to talk with with the city council real quickly. Cindy, if you could bring up the, the aerial. Okay. Um, I, there you go. Um, so a couple of, um, or a week, or excuse me, late last week, um, we had a citizen that Matt Greiner and I have been working with for almost two years now related to the, um, uh, no, the June 30, 2018 storm. And if you look at this picture here, um, we have a situation where if you look between the houses there, you can see that th there's a uh, area that is actually natural plants and natural vegetation. And, and this is over in the Northwest area of the community. Um, is there a specific name that we have for that area, Matt? It's in Ashton Point. Okay. Yeah, Ashton Point, and, and there's trail that runs through there. So if you haven't been out there, there's a fairly significant area that uh, is where water is to flow from the neighborhood and, and eventually goes into a storm drain uh, where you see the, the heavier grass and then the drain comes um, out under this uh, area. Well, this area also serves as the overflow. So if we have enough storm um, flow that, that fills up that natural area, the overflow comes down between the houses here and then gets out to the street and, and flows into the street. Um, so on June 30 of 2018, with the significance of the storm event, um, well, you can see on, on this picture here, you see the trail that runs through that natural green area. And on the lower right, you see the arrows that go out to the street. And that would be the overflow that goes between the houses. In the June 30 event, with the volume of rain that hit with that event, basically, it filled up this drainage area and overflowed between the houses. And um, it overflowed, I don't know how high it really got between the houses, but the house that's just to the north or to the uh, above that line did get significant damage in the basement. They have a, a window that daylights their basement window there on the south side of their house. And um, that filled up and broke the window and, and filled their basement up with a significant amount of water. And again, that was due to the, the rain event that we had and the volume of water that came down through that area. After the 2018 storm event, um, and that's one of the areas that Matt was looking at as far as are there improvements that need to be made or you know, what can be done. Um, we have several areas around town that we were looking at. You know, was there anything that happened during the storm event that could be corrected? One thing we discovered here is that the overland flow there's a little swale that goes from that, that um, area to the street. And one thing we noticed is the swale was not in the exact location where it should have been or where it was planned for when this area was developed. And so, um, so you can see, you can sort of see the swale in this uh, picture. That's actually the property line there, but you can see it sort of skews towards that house on the north. Well, one thing that after we discovered that that's not the location that was planned, uh, Matt and I talked about this, and I think we talked with, with the public safety, the public works committee as well, is that we wanted to go ahead and reestablish the swale in the same location that uh, was it was planned, which would take it a little bit further away from that house, um, and again, it would still flow to the street. And so, if we have a rain event that that over um, loads that that natural area the next phase is that it would go through that swale and eventually get to the street. Now, it's, it's our belief that we, um, that storm event of, of June 30 was, was well beyond what that swale could hold, and that's part of why there was some damage uh, created um, with the amount of water that we had there. But the property owner is um, very um, uh, concerned that the city has changed the location of the swale and feels that by us taking that action, we are admitting fault with his basement getting flooded out. And, and uh, I would, I wanna um, emphasize to the council that that rain event would have filled that area up no matter where that swale would have been. The swale really didn't have an impact, but when we have a smaller rain event, that swale could help 
keep the water flowing from that natural area to the street and and protect his property there. So um, the gentleman that we were working with, his name is Mr. Ross, and he um, expressed some concern about that. I did share his email with the entire council just so you were aware of it. And I just wanted to share this information with you and, and highlight uh, what we did to try to improve that situation there. And Mr. Ross still isn't um, uh, happy with the, the actions of the city um, and uh, still uh, you know, has requested that we pay for part of the damage to his home. Um, so again, I just wanted to share this with the council to give you a visual of, of what that area looks like. Matt, do you have anything else you wanna to add to my comments? So uh, Cindy, if you could go back to that second or the middle picture there. So what Jim was pointing out is the brown line is actually our storm sewer. And that there's that there's an intake right there at the very corner of his property that was overwhelmed and the water pushed out through the swale. He does have, like Jim mentioned, there is a daylight window there on the south side of the house. When we went in and had discussions with Mr. Ross and staff went in and fixed that swale, there was also a low spot in his rear yard that he wanted us to repair that was outside of the easement. We said that we couldn't take those um, corrective actions because if we did that, it would trap water in his backyard and would, it wouldn't get out to the swale. But the other thing that we mentioned to him is on his window well, he's got some room to raise that. So we've, we've asked for him to um, add some additional protection to that, to that window well by raising his window well in case you do get another event like this. Um, hopefully with raising that well and us constructing the swale um, to the proper depth and location, it would uh, help mitigate or minimize any impacts that it may have on him in the future. Thank you, Matt. And so again, this was really just to give the council a, a, an update. The resident has communicated, um, had communicated with the mayor and a council member, and I just wanted to make sure the whole council was aware of the situation here. So Matt, we have already made the corrective action, taken the corrective action on the swale. Yes. Okay. And he was supportive of that. Yeah, we worked with uh, Mr. Ross and his neighbor there to the south. The easement actually crosses both properties. Um, so we went in, made that corrective action. It, it actually runs, should run over the top of the storm sewer pipe. And that's what Jim had, had made the comment. It, it seemed like when there was home construction, it maybe got shifted a little bit further north than it should have been. Um, we have re we've placed it back within the easement it may not be centered on that easement, but we have taken those corrective actions. We did that work, um, I wanna say last October. Okay. Yeah, fall of 2019, the swale was reestablished. Thank you. Welcome. Again, this was more informational to the council, but we'd answer any other questions you may have. Does anybody else have questions? Okay, Jim, do you have anything else for us this evening? I think that's it for this evening. Okay, then we'll go to city council comments. Councilman Soroika. Not here. Councilwoman Martin. I have a, a question for the council for discussion. Um, Back when we were doing the budget meetings in January, there was discussion of providing audio and video of the council meetings. And at that time, it was decided not to spend the money on additional equipment to provide the video. Um, but the last, has it been three meetings have been on Zoom and Zoom records uh, both audio and video. So I kind of made the assumption that the um, audio and the video would be available to the public. But instead, city staff has just provided the audio because that is what we had in the past and that is what we're providing now. So I'm asking uh, for clarification from my fellow councilmen. I assume that if we could do video at no additional expense, that we would provide that to the public. Um, and 
And so that's my question. Why wouldn't, if we have it, why wouldn't we put it out there? So Councilman Martin, you're talking about for the council meetings that we're doing over Zoom? Yes. Not for when, not for when we actually return, if, if we presumably return to the old city if, hall. If we return, I don't know how we would do it unless we all right. sat in front of our laptops. Right. Uh, well, if there's no additional cost, um, I don't have a problem with the recording the video as well. I, I'm not sure exactly how it will work. I presume it picks up the video of the person who's speaking, um, but I, I really don't know how the Zoom video, I've not gone back and looked at any video of a Zoom call I've been on, but I, I don't have a problem with doing the video um, of the Zoom meetings. But again, <laughs> pres presuming it's not a cost or, or, a, or a size or issue, or it, if staff doesn't have a significant concern, then I'm fine with it. Yeah, and this is this is Jim. I uh, uh, we we have looked at some of the Zoom video, and basically, you, what you see on the screen right now is what this, the community would see if we went ahead and posted this. We did do some research into what other communities are doing. We um, we knew that Urbandale was providing their Zoom video, but what we found is the communities that were doing video before are are using are also downloading or loading their Zoom videos of their council meetings. It appears that the cities that weren't doing video before, such as Johnston, they, they are still providing their audio as opposed to um, adding the video to that. So we, um, you know, again, we hadn't, we hadn't done that. I mean, we haven't been doing video. The, the only other concern that staff had was, you know, when you think about, you know, if our citizens are using the audio and, and tracking our council meetings through that, which they will do until you know we get our new city hall and we have the cameras available if we do you know the two meetings that we've already had this meeting and, and possibly the next maybe more you know then we're um uh, just being inconsistent and so the citizens may look at that and say hey i'm gonna you know start watching the council meetings because they're available now and then you know maybe in june if we go to back to our regular there won't be the audit, the video option available because we'd be going back to the audio that we have had direction to do so so that that was really the issue i felt that that uh if we want to change our process i i prefer that we have a you know a, a full council give us direction to do that um and i i'll let cindy talk just quickly if she is there any um um uh, issues as far as you know whether we can um download this and, and provide it as far as technology cindy no, it, it really, um, for, for me, and I believe for Janet, I'll let her speak too, but for us, I think it really was just a matter of do it now, don't do it in the middle, do it again when we move. It, that was really all. It, from a staff standpoint, it doesn't cost us any more money. It, it you know, maybe a few minutes time. It's, it's, not a, it's not a hardship at all. We just were worried about being inconsistent. We already, um, you know, meetings before 2017 are in one place, meetings after 2017 are in another place. So we were just trying to keep it consistent. But again, if the council, if that's the council's direction, we will certainly go that way. This is Suresh speaking. Um, we can continue to have the Zoom meetings even when we get back to the council, right? Into the building. We sit in front of the camera and still do the Zoom meetings. So I, I don't think that could be an issue at that point in time either. So we could still do that. I'm comfortable. Um, I think if we have the video, might as well use it. So I'm yes. comfortable with what councilwoman's proposed. Yeah, I, I, I'm comfortable too. I'm not sure I, I'm following with what council Someone uh, ready is talking about as far as continuing to do. Well, let me just because I mean when I, I obviously when we're doing the when you're doing a, uh, the Zoom meeting or you're doing it you're look right in the the computer that makes sense. But at a council meeting I'm not going to look at my monitor when I'm talking to the mayor or I'm talking to another member of the council. So I, that's where I'm not sure that I would see it. So you, yeah, yeah, I understand you'll not be looking at the camera, but. There are people be still looking at you, and it's just a video. Uh, I don't see much of a problem if you can continue Zoom meetings even when we are back in the building. I think she should be able to do it. 
Yeah, whatever. I, I mean, we'll, I guess we'll worry about that when we get there. So, I. Yeah, Cindy, here, here's the question that I have, and, and it's the concern that I expressed previously, and that is members of our public who attend the meeting and, and speak, whether they're on the agenda or just want to speak publicly, um, how, how would we handle that with Zoom? Can we, can we handle that with Zoom? There is a um, recording disclaimer that we can certainly put out um, on the meeting that would say, you know, that this meeting is being recording and will be brought, we'll, we'll put it on our YouTube channel. Um, so we can certainly put that disclaimer out there so people are aware. Yeah, but I mean, just in terms of, would they be audio only or would they be visual as well? Video if as they, well. If they had their video on during the Zoom meeting, they would be video as well. I guess I don't understand why it's an issue. Why? why? Why do we have to do video? I don't understand why it's even an issue. Well, I, I can speak to that. Either way, but I've had nobody ever ask me for video. I've ever had anybody ask me for audio. And I just don't understand why, why it's an issue. I can speak to that. I have um, more than one occasion had opportunities where I would want to Oh, am I on? Am I? Yep, yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I've had more than one occasion where I've gone back to the actual audio to listen to a meeting, to listen to a discussion. And the way it works now, when you want to try and listen to a meeting, it is a big, um, it's a big file, and there is no um, markers. Um, and in fact, I don't know, maybe it's my technology, but I didn't see any way that you could actually uh, fast forward. So you have to listen to the whole entire discussion to get to the, uh, to the conversation you want. And the cues that you could, if you had a fast forward on a video, you could know when someone was talking and you're, or you could see, Oh, I remember this part. Okay, we're going past this part where the developer was talking, and then we could get to that portion. It would be it would be much more user friendly. So that would be the one thing. It's very much more user friendly. It's tedious to try and find things now when you're just looking to to an audio and you have to listen to the entire thing. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing, I have been asked on more than one occasion by people that cannot attend the meetings that they would like to look at it in terms of a video for just the same reason. It's much more easy to see what's going on than to just listen to a blank audio, you know, a, a holistically audio. Well, and I assume with video, you might have the document. So if there was like a zoning map or something, you might be able to see that on video versus audio. That's true. So, but, but, but what we're talking about here, I, I just, I want to understand what's being, what we're talking about is just during the temporary time that we're doing Zoom meetings, or is this proposal, is, is, is this a proposal as we move forward to do it at every meeting? I'm willing to just propose for now, because we have it, because it is not costing us any money, that we go ahead and put it out there. And then if there are issues that come up, we have some track record for how how it is you know how it is performing. So I'm not I'm not asking for at right this moment a decision on Zoom meetings going forward until the city hall is up and we're moved in and all the capabilities are there. What I want to start out with is just saying we have the file, put the file out there. I'm okay with that. I am too. This is Councilman Cope. I, I'm fine with that too. I do think that, you know, we, we have spent a ton of time discussing video at the current city hall. When frankly, I think, I hope staff is more focused on making sure that when we move to the new city hall, we have a system you know, we've talked about multiple cameras, uh, and I, I want to make sure that the staff is 
investigating to make sure that when we move into the new city hall, we have a we do video the right way, and we also incorporate. Uh, you know, I think the point that Council Martin made about, you know, I, you know, this markers where you where it's easier to kind of advance through so you can find the item. I, I think that's frankly, instead of trying to kind of, uh, you know, make a current system that isn't probably all that set up very well in the current city hall work, I think that's focused on when we are in the new city hall, making that system be much better. Um, instead of kind of rehashing this debate about the old city hall. Uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm like Councilman Evans. I've never had anybody ask me about this. Everybody who cares about this must talk to Councilwoman Martin because you, the next time they talk to you, you, I would encourage you to encourage them to talk to to Jim and the mayor and myself because we never hear this issue. So. Okay. And, and I guess I, I'm, 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 I'm going to have to give some thought to how this works with members of the public wanting to speak and just what. I, I, it seems to me that if we do this at the beginning of every meeting, just like I give a statement on COVID, I need to give a statement on, you know, this is being video recorded, um, just as a, as, a, as a notice, so that people aren't surprised. Because we don't have a policy on it. I mean, that, that was part of the, you know, that was part of our discussion before. We don't have a policy on this. And so, you know, there hasn't been any notice to the public that we're going to be doing this. So if, if this is the direction that we're headed, I think we need to give a, give a statement at the beginning of every meeting that this is what's going to happen. Probably wouldn't hurt since we are going to do it eventually. Yeah, and, and again, we, you know, we don't, again, we haven't talked through what this policy is going to be. So we're kind of making this, we're making this up as we go along and we'll figure out how it works. Well, I heard at least support from three council members. Please think, this is Jim. Thank you. That's the direction we needed. So we will plan on posting the the video from the Zoom meetings um, on, I think it's going to be YouTube, isn't it, Cindy? Yes, it will. Also, Mayor, I don't know if you saw my note to you. There's a member of the audience who wanted to talk on this as well. I did, and we typically don't do that during city council comments, so... And see, the, I mean, that we, when I can't see people, I can't, I, know. I can't give that, that bodily cue, like, no. I know. <laughs> and she, she wrote, she commented to all of you and also said she understands that. So. Great. Okay, let's see. Who do we have left? Uh, Councilman Cope? Uh, yeah, first of all, I just want to compliment uh, uh, John Schmitz and the parks and rec folks for their, your tree sales uh, that the uh, we have a swamp oak now in our backyard fully planted and uh, so appreciate that was a great program also it's really great to see the progress being made on the pioneer parkway uh, trail um, and so just want to pass that along that project looks like like looks like it's going really well so councilman Evans good you good okay well, the only thing that I would add to the uh, compliments pile is uh, we had uh, our virtual Kites on the Green this past weekend, and, and uh, it was an incredible success. We were a little bit uh, weather challenged initially, but uh, the sun did come out, the wind picked up, and uh, we had good feedback from many residents uh, in our community who appreciated seeing the, the show kites flying in the sky. Um, and just an opportunity to, to get out with our families and, and uh, do, uh, do something a little different uh, this weekend. So thanks to all of the staff and, and the volunteers who uh, made, uh, uh, made Kites on a Green a, a, a great event uh, despite our, our challenges in themselves. So thanks for that. Great. Do we have anything else for the good of the order? Nope. If not, uh, then we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.